Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you are. My name is Bob McConnell, co-founder of the U.S.-Ukraine Foundation and um, I guess secretariat of the Friends of Ukraine Network. Uh, all of the panelists we have today are part of the Friends of Ukraine Network. It's a distinguished panel. Probably everyone is known to the people who will tune into this webinar. Generals Wesley Clark and Phil Breedlove, both former Supreme Allied Commanders Europe, Lieutenant General Ben Hodges, former U.S. Army Commander Europe, all positions capping extraordinary military careers in service to the United States. Deborah K Kagan, who has served in both the State and Defense Departments, uh, but her titles fall far short of indicating the sensitive and critical mission she has undertaken in her relationships throughout Washington and around the world. Uh, so let's begin. President Zelensky obviously made a very strong and positive impression during his visit uh, here in Washington. And he did not, but he did not get any new commitments regarding weapons and logistics for Ukraine's war against Russia. Indeed, as an article in today's Wall Street Journal notes, Washington seems to send, continues to seemingly to send mixed messages as to what it really wants to happen. And frankly, the administration seems to have left President Zelensky the responsibility to make the case for why the United States should be giving Ukraine what it needs to defeat uh, Russia. Compared to how administrations for a long period of time, Republican and Democratic administrations, routinely advance their top priorities on the Hill and to the American public, the administration clearly has not made Ukraine's winning a priority in its advocacy efforts. Deborah, why isn't the administration making the case to com combat the arguments about aid to Ukraine being a waste of money and so on? Well, the first thing I'll say is, uh, and I have a theory on this, and some people don't agree with this theory, so I'll present it that way. I think the administration is uncomfortable and doesn't know what to do uh, with Russia when Putin loses. And I'm going to say when he loses as opposed to if he loses. And I think um, this would not be the first time the U.S. administration has been faced with this when the Warsaw Pact first fell apart and then <clears throat> the Soviet Union. There were brave souls in, the, in those administrations. They were both Republican and Democrat who understood that we had a chance for a brave new world and a way of looking at things differently. And they went forward and did that. So instead of you know, going away from it, they embraced it and went forward. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me, I think there's still an issue of <clears throat> a lack, <clears throat> I'm sorry, a lack of strategic thinking of what you do when Putin loses, what this means for Russia, what this means for Europe, what this means for US national security at large. And I think this is not really about escalation at this point, because it's, um, all three generals on this have said multiple times in public, uh, there's been a lot of threats and not a lot of uh, filler to those threats. But I think it's about uncomfortableness with what happens when Russia is no longer Putin's Russia. And so I think there's a move to uh, try to stop Putin from losing as opposed to helping Ukraine win. So I just wanted to put that out there. In, in terms of cost savings and the like, I don't think the strategic messaging has been good at all. Uh, we have not been very public uh, in response to both the left and the right in this country on how much our allies have actually done for Ukraine. And I, I am the first to say that uh, allies would not step up, but they are stepping up. And some countries like the Czechs and others in the, in the Baltics have drained their almost entire defense structures in support of Ukraine. I mean, huge amounts of assets and resources have gone to Ukraine. Um, other countries like Finland, a country of five and a half million people has delivered over, over 185 million euros 
in assistance to Ukraine. They just delivered their 11th tranche. So the first thing is we're not messaging that um, allies and partners are burden sharing more than they potentially have in the last 40 years. And I think that's worth noting because we keep hearing these things that Europe isn't doing enough, but per capita, they're doing quite a bit and we're not talking about it. Um, and then the second part of this is, um, and I leave this to the generals here, but if you look at, uh, if you look at Berger in the, in the Marine Corps, if you look at what General McConville just said, there are things that our services are doing in terms of structuring the forces, looking forward into the future, um, how they see the future battle space that are informed by what's been going on in Ukraine. Uh, what to do, what not to do, uh, heavy armor brigades, um, what kind of role, um, you know, small drones are going to play in the battle space in the future. So there are a lot of things here that are cost savings next to, I mean, I, I don't want to belittle this, but the amount of assistance the U.S. has provided, which is what we in the State Department used to call them the Pentagon couch change, you know, the things that fell out of someone's pockets. And when you compare that, to the amount of cost savings the U.S. is going to make, not only in terms of blood and treasure, but in terms of how it looks toward preparing the, the battle space for the future, how it takes on China and the Indo-Pacific. A lot of these are now being informed by what is seen as success and what is seen as failure in Ukraine. And I'll leave it there. Well, thank you, Deborah. I mean, it does seem... There is so much to say and, and to convince people, both in Congress and in the public, to understand <clears throat> why this is such an important uh, undertaking for the United States. You know, modern communications make this more <clears throat> very accessible. Uh, the public and surely our officials see not only <clears throat> what's going on with the blasting of the infrastructure and so forth, but the <clears throat> carrying on of a barbaric war of indiscriminate death and destruction, kidnapping children and taking them to Russia for re to be reprogrammed into being Russian. How can, I mean, what, how can we hold back on getting everything Ukraine needs to defeat Russia? Well, Bob, um, first, I think you have to understand uh, in our audience has to understand the position of the United States. That is to say, our interests are not congruent with Ukraine's interests. President Zelensky has said he wants all of the territory restored. The United States really, what we want in the United States is, we want to stabilize, reduce the chance of a NATO-Russia conflict, <clears throat> hold on to as much of Ukraine as we can <clears throat> without starting World War III <clears throat> and focus on containing China. That's what it's about. <clears throat> this administration has been consistent and the people in the administration have been consistent since 2011. It's been all about China. And I think they have missed the key linkage between Russians' aggressive behavior and the ability to manage the ascent of China. That is to say, China not only has an alliance with Putin, but they're watching American response. They're watching the intimidation of the administration by Putin and Lavrov's references to nuclear weapons. And I have no doubt there are, <clears throat> in the classified realm, indicators of alerts, testing, uh, movements of things that keep this threat alive, even though we're not reading as much about it in the newspaper. And so <clears throat> they're playing on what has emerged as a hole in American deterrence. We believe strategic nuclear equivalence gives us the ability to deter conflict. Putin believes strategic nuclear equivalence gives him the ability to exploit conventional military forces while we stand aside. And <clears throat> that's the test here. If we really believe in liberal democracy, in a rule-based international order, then we must support 
the conditions that President Zelensky has given for the initiation of the peace talks. And I, I, I summarize it to four things, really. Russia out, <clears throat> all the abducted people, especially the children, returned and accounted for reparations and war crimes. And without those four, <clears throat> we will have failed in upholding the rules-based international order. And we will also have failed in setting the example that helps us to manage China. So there's a dissonance here in the American polity that has to be worked through. How can we deal with this dissonance? I think first, this is about information warfare. I think President Zelensky's done an admirable job of laying out the tragedies, the criminalities of Russian behavior. But I don't think the West has lived up to its obligation to speedily establish a war crimes tribunal that will bring these crimes to justice or criminals to justice. We're withholding this. I saw this in my experience as Supreme Allied Commander. When it was time to indict Slobodan Milosevic, there were those in the White House who said, oh no, this might make it hard. It didn't, it made it easy. Indicting Putin for war crimes, indicting the rest of these generals by name for war crimes, we know what they are. It's obvious, this strike this morning is more of it. So that's the first step. That's the first step we need is a active, real war crimes tribunal that holds them to account. The next thing we need, Bob, is a realistic appraisal and support for Ukraine's needs. I consider it a tragedy that in his visit here, President Zelensky wasn't given the assistance he's asked for. He needs more tanks. He needs Western tanks. He needs artillery. We need to go to a partial mobilization of our industrial base. The idea that we can't produce Patriot, more Patriot batteries for two years, that's hogwash. We need to demand it be done, put the money behind it, put the resources behind it. It's an important indicator of our ability to handle China, and it will serve a purpose for deterrence as well as assisting Ukraine. So three things. Number one, the war crimes tribunal. Number two, getting <clears throat> the proper military assistance to Ukraine. Actually, what they need right now more than anything else is a switchblade 600 loitering drone. That's the immediate antidote to these massive attacks by Russia. And the third thing is the mobilization of the U.S. industrial base so that we can continue to supply them with the 155 ammunition, the high Mars, the spares, all the other things they need to prosecute an offensive. We don't want a stalemate in Ukraine. It's not in our interest and the administration should say so. Well, thanks, Wes. Um, a, lot of, a lot to consider there. Uh, Phil, you know, we've you've talked about, we've all talked about uh, what Ukraine needs. And of course, right now, uh, among the things that uh, we have held back on is the uh, the length of the artillery that or the ability to fire at uh, Russia leading to sanctuaries. And I know you have strong feelings about that, Phil. You're muted. You're muted. <laughs> Trying to keep my coughing down. Thanks for having us all together. So much good has already been said. I want to just touch a few of those things again, uh, because I think the first and most important thing that uh, Ukraine needs from the United States is really policy. It's decisions to take the next steps or decisions to take the steps that we should have taken 11 months ago, in my mind. And then we can talk a little bit more about uh, where we find ourselves now with sanctuary. So it's good. 
And we need to be thankful for what the American people and the Congress and others are doing to provide for Ukraine. It is important and it has been uh, uh, significant, but we have fallen short in some areas. And I think those are places we need to begin to address. We continue to say that we're going to support Ukraine and that we will be there for as long as it takes. President Zelensky once again was articulate in what he and the Ukrainian people want to happen in Ukraine. But yet we in America at a policy level do not choose to use those words. We avoid the words and the, the desires of President Zelensky and use a much more uh, a toned down approach of supporting them for as long as it takes. President Zelensky articulated very close to what West just said, Russia out, pre-2014 lines. Uh, he's been very clear about that. And yet here in the United States as a policy, we avoid that kind of uh, conversation. And I think that's important. We need to lead so that the rest of the world can also follow as they typically do. To the, to the issue of sanctuary, this is a word that many inside the, uh, the administration don't like to hear, but in effect, in my mind and in my opinion, we have created sanctuary for Russia. And Wes and others can tell you how sanctuary affects a combatant commander and the ability to carry a war. And we have told uh, not only Ukraine verbally and technically <clears throat> by limiting their weapons that we are not gonna support them firing <coughs> into Russia. If you take a map out and look at where Russia has fired into Ukraine from, it's almost 300 degrees on the compass rose from the northwest edges of Belarus, all the way around the east side of the compass to the southwest edges of the Black Sea, Russia is firing into Ukraine from all points and countries. And yet we forbid Ukraine from returning fire into Russia. And we continue to basically assure Russia in the press and in the public venues that we are going to limit Ukraine so that they will not strike. And so what this does is build sanctuary for Russia. And right now, I believe they are, they are exploiting this sanctuary by all of the narratives of what they're, the force and capability that they're building up in Belarus, uh, intimating that there will be a new front and that this will now threaten Kyiv again from the north and that fires, long range precise fires from the missiles that Russia are putting into Belarus will be striking even more often into uh, Ukraine. And so I believe we need to have a policy discussion at the senior most levels about do we continue to support a sanctuary for Russia as we are now in fact, we may not be stating it, but we are in fact, uh, um, giving Russia sanctuary and assuring them that sanctuary. And so I believe just like uh, both of the previous commentators have said that we need to be looking at those capabilities that Ukraine needs not to strike indiscriminately into Russia as Russia is striking indiscriminately into Ukraine, but to strike Russian forces Russian capabilities and Russian long range fires that are in these uh, Russian lands and Belarusian lands and North Northern Black Sea. We need to give Ukraine the ability to fight in the same manner that we are enabling Russia to fight. <clears throat> Phil, um, I, I I think that's critically important what you said and it ties into what's been said before. And Ben, I know you feel strongly about this. Very early this morning, we we commented about the reports that new uh, Russian ships in the Black Sea and what they're doing. You might comment on that and how that impacts into sanctuary type of thing uh, situation. So it's exactly 
300 kilometers straight line distance from Odessa to Sevastopol. So if Ukraine had ATACMs right now, they could already be making Crimea untenable for Russian forces, for the Russian Navy in Sevastopol, for Russian air bases, for where the Iranians are uh, helping to train and set up uh, their their drone launching sites, uh, all the different things that that make Crimea uh, important for Russia could be uh, already getting pounded by Ukrainian long range fires. I mean, look at the reaction of the Russians when they when the Ukrainians launched their own drones, the uh, maritime drones. What happened there? Uh, they relocated their submarine fleet after one drone hit Sevastopol. So you can imagine the impact if uh, they were regularly dropping uh, ATACMs or similar type long-range precision weapons into the uh, critical military facilities in Crimea. Uh, obviously, I associate, I'd like to associate myself with everything that uh, uh, my three uh, panel, fellow panel members have said. <clears throat> I, I can't add much to what they've said, except that uh, the administration can't bring themselves to say the words, we want Ukraine to win. And so that is that is policy. And um, I think uh, part of this is because of a traditional sense that somehow Russia can't be defeated, that we're going to need Russia, and we're really focused on China and all that. Um, and, and I think what West, the way West said that earlier is better than I could. But it's also because they don't believe that Ukraine can win. I mean, I know that for a fact. They don't believe that Ukraine can actually win. And so when you combine that with um, the notion, this exaggerated sense of fear that Russia might escalate, it causes them not to do certain things that would help Ukraine win more quickly. And so it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because of bad policy and an exaggerated fear that Russia might somehow magically uh, come up with a new thing to escalate. When in fact, uh, we have been self-deterring ourselves since the first argument about whether or not to give Javelin uh, and then the argument about whether or not to give Stinger. Holy hell, now, now we're delivered Patriot and Russia has not escalated a single time because they have nothing with which to escalate uh, uh, other than the threat of use of a nuclear weapon. Um, and and their, their nukes are really most effective when they don't use them because once they do use them, then it's absolutely going to be over for them. And I think that the Kremlin and the, Ukraine, uh, the Russian general staff believe President Biden when he said that there would be catastrophic consequences. I think they believe that and that... Um, uh, so I, I think that uh, the likelihood of Russia being able to escalate with a nuclear weapon is very, very low. And even if they did, it would not change anything on the battlefield and, and they would lose any hope they had of some sort of sympathy from most European countries. Now, I would like to make just one more uh, comment. Uh, uh, Phil brought up uh, Patriot earlier, uh, and, and I love Patriot. We had one battalion for all of Europe. It was always my biggest concern when I was commander of U.S. Army Europe that we could not defend anything other than maybe Ramstein Air Base. I mean, it take the whole battalion of Patriot to defend Ramstein Air Base. So that gives you some sense of, of the requirement and the challenge. And I certainly never uh, or I failed to anticipate that Russia would use uh, precision weapons like they are against civilian targets. I was always thinking we have to protect Ramstein, we have to protect Bremerhaven, we have to protect critical infrastructure. The requirement now is to protect about 450 million people. And so the requirement is so much uh, more significant. Uh, and, and of course, you, you air defense doesn't come in a box. I mean, you have to practice and train. And how do you link together uh, airborne platforms, uh, all the sensors, uh, all the different types of shooters and making sure that you're not shooting down a friendly airliner or friendly aircraft. It is very, very hard in a heavily contested electronic warfare environment. <clears throat> so I think uh, I'm sure that we are learning a lot watching what's happening now. Uh, the, the Patriot battery that's going, that is a gigantic step up in terms of capability, but in terms of capacity, 
um, probably uh, it will be enough to protect Kiev if it's properly integrated into all the other existing systems. I mean, that's that's what we're talking about is basically one city. When we had Patriot deploy Turkey uh, to protect Turks from uh, Scud missiles flying out of Syria, you had a, an American Patriot battery that were basically was responsible for protecting uh, the city of uh, Adena. You had a Dutch battery that was responsible for protecting Interlake. And then uh, uh, Phil will remember the, the German battery was out in Koroman Mirage protecting another populated area. And that's that's what we're talking about. So having reasonable expectations uh, for what Patriot will do, uh, I, I think will be important. Uh, Bob, let, um, me, let me jump on that just okay. to, yeah. to make one further point. Uh, ben explained it extremely well. And speaking to a group of Americans in the last two days, I find that there is a great misunderstanding of the capacity versus requirement problem. Uh, Ukraine is a very large nation, and while the Patriot, as Ben explained, is a magnificent weapon system, it is very much a point defense weapon system. And uh, there are Americans that are confused that by sending a battery of Patriot, we have solved the missile problem for Ukraine. Nothing could be further from the truth. What it will mean is at some point in the future, we will have the ability to defend some, maybe a highly critical uh, um, area, but the capacity will have to be much higher. And as I was speaking to Ukrainians recently, this is now going to be about brutal prioritization, not only of what they're going to protect, but what they're going to shoot at. If we use the Patriot to shoot at $50,000 um, drones from Iran, uh, we're gonna be in a bad place. We need to be using the, the Patriot to shoot at those high-end missiles that are attacking uh, into Ukraine, over. Well, that, I mean, I think that goes into a couple of things, well, a lot of things. Wes, you talked about how, you know, we need to go into production and get more Patriots on the line in our district. I mean, that goes beyond Patriots, get our uh, military um, production underway in a big way. The other thing is, you know, uh, Ben, you were talking about, and we've all talked about this. First, we, we needed to get javelins. No, there are not going to be any javelins. Finally, there were javelins. No, there won't be any stingers. Then finally, there were stingers. It seems to me that every weapon system that we have given, we have started by saying, no, you can't have it. And then eventually, this drip, drip, drip. Um, you can't fight a war with drip, drip, drip. It doesn't seem to me. Uh, we need to be providing them, I'll use your line, Phil, right weapon, right place, right time. And all those things haven't come together yet. Uh, we need to get things there so that they can win, but that goes to the whole policy question. Do we want them to win? Uh, and Wes, it looked to me like you were ready to chime in there a few minutes ago too. Uh, well, can I, Bob? Look, yes. I want to raise a question that, an issue that <clears throat> it, it, it's, it's underlying, it's a very sensitive issue. But who's responsible in the U.S. chain of command for the success in Ukraine? Who's responsible? The answer is no one. You see, the way it works is that the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff is a resource allocator, a manager. It's been decided in the national security strategy that China is the priority. The Supreme Allied Commander in Europe, the Army Commander, the Air Force Commander, they're all there to help. But have they been given the mission that Ukraine will succeed? Absolutely not. Much less being having been given the mission that Ukraine will win. Now, let me give the let me give some historical perspective. During the Cold War, European allies always doubted when the chips were down, 
would it really be the case that the United States would go for nuclear release in the case of a Russian or Soviet attack <clears throat> sweeping across Germany? Would it really happen that way? We put our troops there. We had a U.S. commander. The reason the Supreme Allied commander was American was because it showed an unbreakable American commitment to Europe. There's no such commitment there. We don't have nuclear weapons there. The Biden administration has said they'll back Zelensky, but they haven't said that they support his ultimate goals. We don't have an American officer on the ground saying, boss, you got to do this. You got to do this. You got to do this. What I learned in Vietnam as an infantry company commander was when you're in contact and you ask for artillery support and somebody says, wait out, you don't wait out very long. You come back on the net and say, boss, I need that artillery. I need it now. Is there anyone in the U.S. chain of command responsible for articulating these needs and pressing them? When I was the U.S. commander in Panama, responsible for U.S. military work in Latin America, <clears throat> my boss was General Shalikashvili, and he said, you're the spokesman for Latin America. So we expect you to come to Washington and advocate for it. Advocate for it. I did. So when I was a NATO commander and there was conflict in the Balkans, it was actually, I was the commander responsible for it. There's no commander actually responsible for Ukraine's outcome. It's a policy issue. Yes, there's a U.S. policy that says don't get into World War III. But it's all being adjudicated in a hundred different channels. Um, there's DOD people who say, well, you can't give them this because uh, of technology. And there's somebody who said, well, you can't do that because of the budget. Somebody else says, well, this goes, needs to go in FMS. Somebody else says, well, this might cause an escalation risk. And it sort of bubbles around and gets up to the White House. And they say, look, um, look, um, we are where we are. We're certainly behind President Zelensky. Uh, no, it's exactly what you said, uh, Bob and <clears throat> Ben and Phil is like, we can't give you high Mars right now, um, but you don't need it. We can't give you ATACMs right now. We can't give you the loitering drones. We can't give you the F-16s. We can't, oh, the M-1s, oh, that's, that's much too tough. I mean, no Ukrainian would ever be able to handle an M-1 tank. I mean, there's a certain sort of disengagement, a unwillingness to face the reality of what we're engaged in with the Russians here. This is for all the marbles. If Ukraine is lost to Putin, it makes the problem of Taiwan unmanageable. And that's the simple fact that this administration must recognize. How, how, I mean, we have webinars, other people have webinars, there are speeches, there are op-ed pieces. How do we get the administration to face that fact? Anybody, Deborah? So, so a couple of things. I've been, uh, I've been engrossed by the, uh, the being in such august company here of these three generals. So um, I think that has like a, a seasonal theme to it, the three generals here. But I, um, I've been listening to this and I, I think the one thing that has been consistent in this all along, it, the one body that can change the administration's mind has been Congress. And, um, and I think all of us have been very much engaged in that. And I think that's gonna become even more critically important as new members uh, take their seats in the new year who have spoken disparagingly about the amount of assistance going to Ukraine. So I think uh, the, the administration has been swayed in the past even though we're all really brilliant and we all say brilliant bone bones about all of this, uh, they've most been, uh, their minds have been changed mostly by members of Congress on this. 
And so I think keeping that drumbeat going is critically important. But there, there's a couple of other things here that I think um, both, uh, both Ben and Wes have talked about, which is um, the self-fulfilling prophecy or having Ukraine fight with one hand tied behind its back. Um, I think one can make a very strong argument, and I think there's members of Congress who understand this, that if Ukraine had a TACOMS, UAVs that had both loitering, endurance, and and uh, you know and and distance, and um, air, that this war could be over in the spring. And we keep hearing this thing about this can't drag on forever because we'll lose our alliance unity over this and everything else. And um, I think. You can end this sooner rather than later if Ukraine is given the assets it needs to fight the war and stop, as many of you have said, dribbling this out. Um, I want to go back to some of what Ben said here. Um, we all know what the Russians did. When the White House announced that it wouldn't give Ukraine anything over 85 kilometers, the Russians simply moved assets in Crimea beyond 100 kilometers so they couldn't be hit. And it was sort of telegraphing to them, this is where you can put your forces. And, and I'll say one other thing. This is an administration who, uh, which has spent a lot of time talking about international law and that sort of thing. Well, Article 51 of the UN Charter, going back to what Ben said here, Article 51 of the UN Charter affords not only self-defense for a sovereign country uh, as declared as such by the UN, but allows that sovereign country to attack the means of war on the territory of another country. Doesn't give them authority to go after soft targets, but they are perfectly legitimate in attacking, um, in attacking sites where weapons are being used against them in Russia proper, uh, in Belarus. That is legitimate under Article 51 of the UN Charter. And, um, and every time we've raised that with the administration, it's been poo-pooed. And, and then lastly, I'll just say, enough with the World War III analogies. Enough. Enough with the nuclear stuff. Enough with this. It's sort of, um, it's sort of like they're, they're giving themselves nightmares before they sleep at night. Um, this isn't going to result in World War III. We have to stop this game of pretending this is not a proxy war. It is a proxy war. Ukraine's victory uh, is our victory. Ukraine's defeat is going to be our defeat. And, um, and enough with this silliness of if we do X, it's going to lead to World War III. I, I've never seen such preemptive silliness and silliness with devastating consequences in, in, my, in my long career. Um, so stop preempting yourselves from doing the right thing. And it's not a simple case of calling Putin's bluff. Um, but just make this go away, and this can go away really quickly by giving Ukraine what it needs to finish this off. And then this will be a success for NATO, qua NATO, for Europe, qua NATO, for Europe, and also for the United States and the Indo-Pacific. And oh, by the way, I do believe, contrary to what I've heard, that the U.S. can walk and chew gum at the same time, meaning that it can handle Europe and the Indo-Pacific. And to say that you can't do, you have to do one and not the other is ridiculous. Deborah, oh, excellent, excellent. Wes, I'll get to you in one second. One, and I know we all think this, it's always on our minds, but I just wanna say it. When we talk about dribbling things out, when we talk about prolonging this and not doing what Deborah says, give them what they need to, we are talking about the loss of human lives, totally unnecessary, dragging out and more loss of life. Wes? You're mo <laughs> I want to go back to the Wall Street Journal article that you mentioned. We are in the process of feeding into the stalemate. It's not in our interest, but we're doing it. And in the process, we are, let's put it in military terms, we're bleeding Ukraine out. They're taking losses. They're using critical infrastructure. They're losing their energy. They're losing their industrial capacity in the process. And they're losing their financial basis as a nation state. And we're bleeding them out in this. 
Meanwhile, what the Russians have done is they are changing the nature of the battlefield. They are putting in much greater defensive uh, efforts. So the nature of the combat is going to change. And I hear military officers talking about, well, you know, we're going to train these Ukrainians uh, not to need so much artillery. You know, if they could just uh, coordinate, fire, and maneuver better, maybe they wouldn't need to have more artillery. I think that we're behind in a couple of steps in this. Number one is that this is an artillery war. And all of the entrenchments that are being put in, the dragon's teeth and so forth, and the concrete line trenches that we read about in the newspapers, um, they don't make it easier to maneuver. They do make it tougher. And that means you need indirect fire support. And so the idea that you're going to find a path around them, this is no longer the open battlefield that it was last summer. So that what that means is more firepower. That means aircraft, air delivered bombs, JDAMs. It means the aircraft to do it. It means loitering drones. It means the ability to mass long range fires on a single point of penetration. It means going after the second and third defensive lines simultaneously so that you can get a breakthrough. It's a different quality of warfare we're facing up to. And I just hope that our own military commanders understand the difference. We saw the difference <clears throat> it's portrayed very well in the Washington Post article today on the breakthrough in the North versus what happened in the Kyrgyzstan area. And that's just the start of this. So we've got to be very careful in trying to um, lecture the Ukrainians on what they need in the way of battle resources. They're there fighting it every day. And when I hear American officers say, well, you know, they don't really need to win the counter battery fight. They just need to avoid it. That's easy to say from three or 5,000 miles away. When you're there, you need to win that counter battery fight. And that means artillery and rockets of superior range and quality. Thanks, Wes. We have we got a number of questions. I'll, I'm not sure we can get to all of them, but one from David Howard. The missile strikes must be curtailed immediately. What can be done to shut off the supply of missiles and drones from Iran? Uh, who can take take a look at that one? Phil? Well, <clears throat> there are several things that can be done from a policy perspective, meaning have we brought the full power of our uh, non-military tools to bear on this problem with Iran? Um, and uh, I think the answer is there's lots more we could do. Uh, and we, as we talked about when they very first started sending missiles and drones to Ukraine, we could physically interdict en route these capabilities. Uh, and we have not chosen to do that. Um, so uh, we, there are a lot of tools that are still on the table that could be used. It starts first with a policy decision. I, it seems like almost everything we come back to is that we need some new policy decisions. And Deborah is quite correct that in historically, we've got to get the Congress to be uh, pushing the administration over the last hundred years. Congress has been the friend of Ukraine ahead of any administration. Uh, there's questions about this incoming Congress, but we, Friends of Ukraine Network and a lot of others, need to do our job and, and getting hearings and so forth. Um, going back to the sanctuaries, uh, Tim McQuillan asked, do you think the recent missile strikes inside Russia indicate some type of tacit approval by the U.S. to attack more preemptively, not only inside Russia, but also Belarus? Well, I'll, I'll venture out. And again, this is only my opinion. I have no insight from the uh, administration or others, but I, I do not believe we've given them any tacit approval. I think we have been, on the contrary, very straightforward the, with the Ukrainians that we don't want them firing into Russia. Uh, but I believe that the Ukrainians are showing initiative. Um, and this is one of the things that disappoints me. And many times people say, well, 
we can't give them that. It'll take them years and months to learn how to do this, that, or the other. The Ukrainians have proven their capability over and over. I'll always like to tell the story of 2014 when we gave them counter uh, battery radars. Uh, and we digitally limit them, limited them in a similar fashion to what we do today with other weapon systems so that they couldn't see into Russia. <coughs> but the Ukrainians learn how to use those radars and string them together in pairing and doing ways that enhance their capability that we now learn from the Ukrainians as we use our own weapons. So this is a very technically capable, savvy force. We forget that their industries were some of the best in the world before they were chewed up in this war. And uh, we should be thinking of uh, allowing them to do what they can do. And I think they're doing that. I think they're learning ways to use stuff in, uh, to thwart this sort of artificial sanctuary that we've built for Russia. Uh, Harvey Carroll brings up something. I'm not going to read his question as asked, but the question uh, relates to air power and General Breedlove and actually the entire Friends of Ukraine network and recommendations a number of years ago. We didn't we didn't recommend that, that the United States give Ukraine specific uh, aircraft, but we did recommend that we start training uh, Ukrainians on. NATO level aircraft fighters. None of that has been done and President Zelensky is still asking for aircraft. Um, any one of you comment on why the uh, resistance to give any aircraft whatsoever or, or even to do the training? Let me speak to the training first. Um, this is a, a problem that to some degree is real. There are systems that we have that take time to incorporate and to learn how to use. Per my uh, remarks immediately before this, I believe that we sometimes over measure what we think or overestimate what we think it will take Ukraine to bring aboard capabilities. I think they are very capable of bringing aboard new capabilities. But the fact of the matter is there is lead time involved in things like aircraft and some of our uh, more capable air defense systems. And we have passed opportunities as we have been asked to consider those opportunities. We have passed them up. And what that does is in the proverbial uh, genre of the day, it kicks the can further to the right. Uh, and I think we're going to have a big lesson learned after this conflict that we should have taken different policy decisions about beginning training so that we had options in a timely manner during this conflict. Deborah, I just, I call on you because you always are listening and have interesting insights to what everybody else is saying. I, I think, I think, um, I think, General Breedlove is absolutely correct that um, I think that, first of all, Ukraine has um, one of the most high-tech uh, educational systems in the world. They're ranked like number five or six in terms of education in STEM and the like. And I don't think this was taken into consideration by all the naysayers that the generals referred to and said, oh, they'll never be able, we know who we're talking about, they'll never be able to use a HIMARS, they're incompetent, they can't do this. And, um, and they cut the training time that was estimated by the joint staff, uh, not only in half, but beyond half on most of these pieces of so-called sophisticated equipment that Ukraine was never gonna learn how to use. So I think there's just this misunderstanding that Ukraine has a very highly educated, high tech population that has spent a lot of time learning STEM from like the sixth grade on. Uh, different from our educational system. And I think as a result, uh, there were estimates made that were just grossly incorrect. And I, and I think that's something to keep in mind going forward, that you're not dealing with a population that um, has, has basic problems reading a manual. 
um, and I think we, we apply too many of these old foreign military assistance things to countries that we just assume were not very bright and not very well educated. And I think that's hubris on our part, and it's misguided hubris, uh, especially with this country. Um, I, I will also say that um, there's something to be said for starting training on something and then make the decision along the line based on what you see in that training. And, and as we've discussed before, some of our NATO allies have actually done that, where they um, trained first, and then they made the announcement as opposed to thinking and, you know, hand wringing about the announcement, but first seeing what could happen. And when they saw how efficient the Ukrainians were, then they announced that they were going to send this equipment, but saved a huge amount of lead time because they already did the training. Um, one last comment about the Iran issue. Um, Russia is getting weaker in the Middle East. Um, and I'm not sure that that's something that um, both the new Israeli government and, and that the United States are reckoning with at this point. Um, Iran is resuming um, cargo flights into Syria, which had stopped for a very long time because Russia had warned against us. Iran now sees Russia as much lower force numbers in Syria, uh, much less capable, and because Russia is dependent on Iran, it is not the tail wagging the dog anymore. And I think that there is, I think people are slow to recognize that Iran is becoming stronger as Russia becomes weaker in that part of the world, and that there, that you have to start facing up to this, that um, you can deal with Iran directly on this, and you have to, because Russia which did some calming of Iran, doesn't have that power anymore. Thank you. Ben, I know that you're a little limited by time if we, if we go over into the uh, extra 15 minutes. Uh, Victor Rudd brings up a question. I'm going to rephrase it. Uh, because you're in Europe, I want to ask you, you know, part of the Russian propaganda forever has been that Ukraine doesn't really exist, that Crimea is Russian, there are no, there is no Russia. How much is that propaganda? I know it has effects. Uh, there are people in the United States that keep saying, you know, buying into that line. How much do you see that being accepted um, in Europe? Um, I think it's decreased significantly over the past year. I think uh, uh, even the most hardcore committed uh, Kremlin first airs, uh, Germans who, you know, were sympathetic or had that line, uh, I think they actually feel betrayed by what has happened over the past year. And so I, you know, I live here in Frankfurt and I just uh, don't see and hear it from um, many of the Germans that I interact with that are in business or academic, you know, academia or uh, in government. It's not there. There still is... Um, uh, we still have a ways to go that has not yet translated into uh, better policy decisions because of the uh, the left wing of the SPD, which is the lead party in this German coalition, has so much uh, DNA that makes it difficult for them to take a more forward leaning, aggressive stance. And so Ch Chancellor Schultz is held back by that, I think. But nonetheless, I, I don't I don't hear it, it nearly as much as I did even a year ago when people would say, come on, Crimea was always Russia. I mean, that that nonsense. Let me say this, uh, Bob. First of all, uh, Ukraine is in fact going to win. They have achieved irreversible momentum. There's nothing that the Russians have or can do that is going to turn it back. As long as we stick with Ukraine, they, they will retain irreversible momentum. That doesn't mean we don't have many months left of really terrible fighting and that many thousands of innocent people are going to be killed. Uh, I'm sure the Russians will attempt some sort of a, a new offensive with uh, these uh, mobilized troops that are, they're going to send, send to their death without proper training or equipment or even um, halfway good leadership. They're going to attempt that, but they don't have anything, in my view, that can, that can undo this momentum. Um, I mean, after, think of this, after, since 2014 when this started, and then you look at the latest ISW map that shows how much Russia controls, that's humiliating. I mean, the Black Sea Fleet is hiding and Ukraine doesn't even have a Navy. And so 
the, the Russians really can't do much more. And I don't understand why we keep um, uh, deterring ourselves. I think that um, the next two months we're going to see, of course, terrible fighting around Bakhmut and uh, Kramina and the other cities up in the kind of the northeast corner there. Uh, but no matter what they put against the Ukrainians, Ukrainians keep killing them. And um, and I, you, you get the feel that uh, pretty soon these, uh, these terrible weather conditions that soldiers who are untrained uh, are not committed to defending their own country. They don't belong to formations that are trained and believe in each other. They don't believe in their own leaders and they know there's no logistic system backing them up. Those cannot uh, survive or be effective in the pressure of combat. I think that we're going to see the next two months continued pounding by the Ukrainian general staff against Russian logistics, Russian transport, Russian headquarters. The general staff has really impressed me with how professional they are, how thorough they are, how methodical they are. And they're setting the conditions now for the decisive phase of the campaign, which will be the liberation of Crimea. I think they're going to accomplish that by the end of August. Ukraine will never be safe as long as Russia possesses Ukraine. They'll never be safe and they'll never be able to rebuild their economy as long as Russia possesses Crimea. So that's that's the main effort. All roads lead to Crimea and I think they're going to accomplish that. Wes, I mean, uh, Ben, thank you. And if you have to sign off, uh, we understand. Uh, Wes, what do you think about uh, Ben's Crimea by August? <clears throat> Well, I think it's a great plan and I hope it happens. But, you know, it's um, it's also somewhat unpredictable because it, it is a function of uh, U.S. support, uh, allied support, how much the Ukrainians can develop their own logistics space. And um, it's also, remember what we always said at the National Training Center, the enemy has a vote in what works. And so <clears throat> depending on whether there really is a Russian threat to Crimea. You know, I've been hearing about this um, third shock army getting started with 20 bat battle battalion tactical groups since June. They still haven't managed to really put it together. We're watching the um, continuing friction between the general Russian general staff, um, the private military companies. Now it turns out that uh, Minister of Defense Shoigu has his own private military company according to uh, information released publicly today. So <clears throat> there's a lot of confusion in the Russian chain of command. Um, but um, Putin and the Russian character are, they're, they're inured to sacrifice. And there's this mythology that no matter what the loss is, Russia will always come back. And we don't see the evidence of Putin's losing his information war internally. You know, this is a battlefront that we started working on initially before the conflict began, and Putin quickly rolled up his opponents. He got rid of the demonstrators. He shut down the foreign agencies. He blocks the internet. Um, yes, there are people who suspect it. Some people may be getting it. But the mass of the Russian people haven't yet turned against Putin. And this goes back to something that Deborah said originally. We have to look forward to the time that Russia is led by someone other than Vladimir Putin. We absolutely must not believe that we can deal with Putin from a position of st stabilization in Ukraine, cut an agreement with them, and then turn to face China. And yet I still hear people associated with the administration focused that way. Well, if we could just slow this down and uh, remember, we've got to build up our long range fires and get ready to go against China. It's like the dog chasing the car. When you catch it, what do you have? And yet we have a real war going on in Ukraine, which is going to be disastrous if we don't reinforce Ukraine. So I hope that Ben's right. And that's premised on some assumptions we're making about U.S. support and about Russian incompetence. But God help us if we're wrong. Look, in 2008, 
Putin invaded, he, he sparked the war with Georgia. And we, we did nothing. In 2014, in 2013, he, he inter intervened in Syria and, and we said, oh, he can have the quagmire in Syria. That let the Israelis off the hook for helping us because they say Russia is their northern neighbor. We, we, we enabled that. We could have stopped that. We let it happen. In 2014, we let Putin take action in Crimea. We could have stopped that. We could have stopped and the occupation of Donbass, but we didn't consider it was, let's say, significant. I think I saw a quote about something that said, maybe the president had said something like, if anybody wants to start World War III because of Putin being in Crimea, let them speak up. And he said, and I've heard nobody say that. So this is like a 1938 moment. In 1938, Europe decided that for the sake of everybody, Czechoslovakia needed to come apart. I mean, it, it, you just think about it. Now, you know, uh, Europe, we, we, we've been suffering a lot. And so you Czechs, you, you're going to have to put up with it. In a way, we're like a 1938 moment right now. Not the East Europeans, but the West Europeans and the United States. It's like, uh, you know, we don't want to take the risk. Uh, Maybe we can get negotiations. Well, would it be so bad if it stabilized, if we could have Putin sign a document that said he won't attack anymore, uh, if he would stop shelling the infrastructure? Would that be so bad? And there's a lot of a lot of people pushing on the administration and on Congress to see it exactly like that. And my answer is, yes, it would be that bad. We could have stopped Putin easily in 2014. We can stop him now not as easily. Let him have Ukraine. You will face World War III. Thanks, Wes. Uh, sobering. Uh, former Congressman Don Ritter, original co-chairman of the House Ukraine Caucus, asked a question. Any comments on having greater impact on Putin's energy revenues by ramping up U.S. capacity or revenue higher than this year than pre-war. Uh, Deborah, I'm calling you on that one. So I think there's a little bit of, um, thank you, Congressman. There's a little bit of apples and oranges here uh, because uh, because of the way the U.S. refines energy, uh, there's not necessarily a one-for-one -one replacement here. Uh, but having said that, um, the U.S. has um, supplied a huge amount of energy to the European market just since January of this year. I mean, uh, you know, up, up 30 to 40% of where it was before uh, to compensate for this losses. And there's a number of new LNG terminals in Europe that are now up and operating and a number of interconnectors in Europe. Uh, in fact, France just announced one that it's doing with the Iberian Peninsula. Spain and Portugal have been taking U.S. LNG for the better part of almost, uh, you know, seven or eight years now. So uh, there, there are some things uh, that we can do, uh, and some of them involve uh, a much quicker uh, regulatory process that allows U.S. producers and uh, shippers to ship more from the Gulf Coast um, more quickly and without a painful regulatory process. So for example, it's taken some companies over six months to get permission to just expand the size of an LNG terminal and hire more workers to do this. And, and so you have this, on the one hand, the Biden administration saying publicly, we're gonna help Europe with this so that they're less dependent on Russia fossil fuel. On the other hand, you have people in the, uh, the FERC and a DOE who are slow rolling these licenses. So there is this, uh, you know, in the, in the sake of green renewable, et cetera, and a failure to recognize that, that gas still has a trans, transitional value, um, which Europe now, seeing who was holier than thou before, recognizes uh, even more as, as they have trouble heating their homes in the winter. So I do think uh, the regulatory process is still hamstringing some of the US producers and shippers, um, but I think this has picked up. In terms of Russia, Russia announced this past week that 
it would not ship gas to any countries that participate in the, uh, the cap procedure that we announced doing the oil cap and the like. So it would not ship energy, fossil fuel to those countries. We'll see how long this takes. I think Russia has already lost a lot of revenue because its contracts it signed with China and with India, for example, are hugely discounted over what they would have been getting selling in Europe. So I think it is hurting them. They're earning less revenue, but um, I'll throw one other thing out there that people probably don't want to hear. But um, as we move more toward nuclear energy and small reactors uh, to meet um, the US's own green initiatives, I throw this out that, the, that Iran illegally produced more highly enriched uranium over the last two years of the supposed Iran agreement than the US has produced since 2013. So the US is not really, uh, there is no US companies, qua company enriching uranium to use for US nuclear reactors. And in fact, the US imports 26 to 28% of all of its nuclear fuel rods for US nuclear energy from Russia to this day. Ugh. Um. We are coming to the end of our time, and because Ben is still here, I'm not going to let him go. I'm going to do a, a final round, and I'll start with Ben. Anything you want to add? There's an awful lot we have to do and more to be said, but go to you for now for a final comment. We know from history that war is a test of will, and it's a test of logistics. The Ukrainian soldiers and Ukrainian people have demonstrated they have far superior will defending their country than any uh, Russians that they're facing. So when it comes to test of will between Russia and Ukraine, it's clear. Do we have the will, the West, uh, specifically the United States, do we have the will to, to see this through and do what needs to be done? And when it comes to logistics, the reason I am optimistic, and I know General Clark, he was generous, but he was also poking me a little bit. Um, the reason I am confident that Ukraine is going to liberate Crimea by the end of August, is because of logistics. There are only two land routes into Crimea. One is over Kerch Bridge, which has already been damaged, and I am sure will be revisited again in coming weeks. The other one is the, the so-called land bridge that runs from Rostov through Mariupol, Melitopol, and into Crimea. Ukrainians are already able to hit Melitopol with HIMARS and other long-range systems. So the two land routes necessary for Crimea are both already being disrupted and I think they're going to get more and more of that over the next two months, both from fires, uh, partisan activity, uh, and other means that the Ukrainian general staff is cleverly devising so that Crimea begins actually to look more and more like a trap, not a fortress. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. I'll go back to the order we had before. Deborah, final comments? One last thing. Uh, the two worst words I ever heard in diplomacy were frozen conflict. Um, and and it, it continues to be um, a horrific outcome. Uh, you can go back to Moldova in 1992, where we accepted Russian troops who are now 5,000 strong, still permanently. They don't call, they call them peacekeepers, but the Russian troops in Transnistria. Uh, it's, a, it's the case in South Ossetia and Abkhazia and parts of Georgia proper. Uh, where you still have Russian forces there and Russian proxies there because we accepted it as a frozen conflict. And it would be a disaster of magnificent proportion if we were to ex ever accept that in Ukraine as Russians occupying Ukrainian territory going forward. It would be a disaster not only for the United States, but for every country that has to live in that neighborhood. Thank you, Deborah. Wes? My hope is that um, the people who are engaged here enough to listen to this presentation will take action, writing to Congress and others to stimulate the creation of an effective war crimes prosecution capability. Nothing really could do more to keep pressure on Putin to drive the United States to provide the support it needs and to help a successful outcome than indicting Vladimir Putin for war crimes. Thank you, Wes. Yes, we, I'm glad you got back to that. Phil? 
So I'm going to capitalize on what uh, Ben said and what uh, Wes just said. Uh, when we come to will and logistics, a major player of will and logistics in America is our Congress. Much has been said about the upcoming Congress. I still believe Ukraine will enjoy broad support from the left and the right in the new Congress, but there clearly is a wedge now of voices that begin to challenge. And I think it's incumbent on everyone listening and on uh, uh, us as American uh, taxpayers and voters that we make sure our Congress understands where we stand on uh, Russia, as Wes said, and on supporting Ukraine, as all of us have said. Bill, uh, one of our, one of our um, last questions asked, I mean, comment, is that the panelists should be brought out of retirement. Uh, it'd be nice, but if we can just make sure that you're all listened to and that Congress reflects what you're saying, uh, uh, we we have to make that happen in the next few months on Capitol Hill, and I know that we're going to be working together to do that. I thank everybody for watching. I th I certainly thank the panelists for being part of this webinar and being part of the Foundation's uh, Friends of Ukraine Network. With that, we'll sign off for today, and we'll set up another webinars in the future, and we'll be working together and it's nice seeing all of you, and we'll be back together in the new year. Goodbye.